A sister, a friend, I'm every woman. I have taken up arms and I choose to defend all that I hold dear. Independent and strong, you will not keep me down. You can't break me. Monique Oxley here for Fat Track Tactical TV and Ghost the Girls on Fire. 16 days for action for no violence against women and children. I'm here with Nicole Engelbrecht. Welcome, Nicole. Thank you so much, Lynette. It's a real pleasure. It's, uh, you've got, let's start. Who is Nicole Engelbrecht? That is a very good question. <laughs> <laughs> and I think four years ago, I would have given you a very different answer than I'm about to give you. Um, but yeah, so essentially, um, I am a true crime podcaster and a, a true crime author um, that has been my my life really for the last four years which i'm very grateful for because it's all gone yeah it's all, it all sort of exploded at once and it's been really really great to sort of immerse myself in something different um, and then you know before that I, I worked in corporate for 20 years so did something completely different um, but right now, true crime is pretty much my life in, in book form, in podcast form, in, um, you know, doing some uh, TV series and that sort of thing. So that's pretty much what I do. <laughs> right, I actually haven't heard about your TV series yet, so let's have a chat a bit about that as well later. Sure. So tell me a bit about your true crime podcast and why do you say it's a victim-focused podcast? When did it start? How many programs have you done? It's ever, it's ever. Sure. So, um, you know, when I left my corporate career in 2019, I, my the plan was to sort of do a creative entrepreneurship. So, you know, I wanted to have lots of different streams of income, do lots of different um, creative things. You know, I have always been a hobby writer um, and a true crime consumer. So, you know, I realized that there was no there was really no South African true crime podcast out there. And really what, you know, brought it to the forefront for me was I was seeing podcasts in America and the UK that they weren't just sort of entertainment. They were actually um, covering, you know, like cold cases and cases that needed awareness that the mass media weren't covering. And they were helping to bring awareness to these cases and bring leads in. And I thought, well, if there's any country in the world that needs something like that, it's South Africa, you know. So that was one of the the reasons behind me going sort of into the true crime podcast. But I thought that that was going to just be a small part of a whole bunch of other things that I was going to do, you know. So I planned to freelance write and do, you know, other things. But um, as I often say, South Africa had different ideas and the podcast sort of exploded and has pretty much taken over my life. <laughs> um, so now I release uh, weekly episodes. I've done, so I'm on officially on episode 132 um, with a lot of interviews on top of that, which aren't numbered episodes and mini shows and bonus episodes. So probably about 190 episodes in total at the moment since 2019. That's absolutely crazy, but um, South Africa do have, <laughs> if you look at the amount of serial rape and other crimes we have, we're uh, we're a uh, very uh, it's, it's a very rich environment to do this kind of thing, I suppose. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, sadly, uh, you know, our, our levels of crime are extremely high. Um, our levels of violent crime are horrifically high. Um, you know, so really that is the reason that I that I wanted to to start the podcast because um, it's firstly it's you know it's a genre a genre that interests me personally, but I wanted to create something that could be used as a vessel to. Firstly, educate South Africans, but also 
something that's always bugged me about the true crime genre when you watch these, you know, even some podcasts and uh, documentaries and things like that is it's always very focused on the, the perpetrator, um, you know, and that is important from an education perspective because if we don't understand why people do these things, we can't prevent it. But what I've always felt was missing was a focus on the victim and understanding who these human beings who sometimes end up just being headlines, who they were as people, um, you know, because I think that's extremely important. Um, these, you know, individuals need to be far more, they should be more well known than the perpetrators who ended up perpetrating the crime again. I do find the perpetrators sometimes you like the limelight a lot and the victims go into the darkness, unfortunately. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, there's also this this element of, and this happens in countries across the world, where there are certain victims that will get headlines in mainstream media and there are certain victims who won't. And there's often many different reasons for that. Um, sometimes it's race-based. Sometimes it's if, if the person lives in an area that is high crime or high gain activity, they're not seen almost as a... A victim that people would want to read about um, or you know listen to um, a doc documentary or a podcast about and I call those people invisible victims because um, you know I think we see a very small percentage of the number of victims that are actually perpetrated upon every single day and that was one of the things that I wanted to do was bring those invisible victim stories who don't get the headlines to some sort of platform. Um, and I'm just really grateful that the platform has grown as it has. If you think about it, um, if you look at our rates, uh, uh, they said one in six, but I think it's a lot more, uh, report their rates. Um, I discussed this with uh, one of the other people with um, the group uh, recently. And he said to me, a lady came to to, to work, and uh, she was slightly late, and she was just right, and she just picked up her stuff and came to work. Because there is no justice in a lot of uh, uh, cases for these climate uh, at all, especially in South Africa. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, you know, and it starts at a societal level as well. I think. Um, I think South Africans have been extremely desensitized to violent crime, but I think South African women have been de extremely desensitized to sexual assault and rape. Okay. Um, you know, with our high numbers, it's almost been expected that if you are born a woman at some point in your life, you will probably experience some form of sexual assault. Um, you know, so that's a very sad part of it that contributes to women not reporting. Um, and of course, the stigma. Um, as much as we destigmatize rape a lot, um, which I'm very grateful for, there is still a deep stigma that um, you know victims and survivors carry around this needless shame that they should have done something to prevent their own sexual assault or rape. And of course, that's completely incorrect, but it's uh, it's often something that's supported by society and families and communities. Absolutely. So tell me, you mentioned in one of the articles, I think was in, in one of your interviews, that you sometimes uh, help with, uh, you get leads uh, that lead to solving cold cases. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, so I think that, you know, with all the, the wonderful things that have happened around the podcast, that has probably been the most important for me. And that's, you know, in missing person cases and cold murder cases that I've covered is, um, you know, we've had after the, the episodes have been released, sometimes months after someone, you know, because I mean, obviously these episodes remain in the feed and people will listen to them years after they've been released. And on, on quite a few occasions now, I've had people reach out either to me or to the investigating officers in the case and provide new fresh leads on some of these cold cases and you know some of these leads haven't led anywhere they're all being investigated um, some are still currently being investigated and, and certainly may lead to some resolution in these cases um, yeah so that's that's just been an incredible part of it's exactly what i wanted um, 
I, I wonder if, you know, I think maybe in the beginning, I thought maybe that was a bit of a pipe dream because I didn't think that people, South Africans, would get around the podcast and support it as much as they have. But I'm really grateful for that because it's not, you know, when people are listening to the podcast and sharing it now, they're not just viewing it because they're consuming some content. It's, they, they really are empowering themselves and, and helping to make a difference in the a real difference in these cases which is just it's phenomenal it's such a step back um what was your motivation to and your interest in, in crime uh, to actually start this podcast uh, what what was your journey to bring you to this particular point mm. so i think you know again when people ask me have asked me this question throughout my journey i've had different answers and i think if you asked me when i started it would have been a different answer too you know the pure motivation as i've said was um to do what i've started to achieve to you know create a platform for victims of violent crime in south africa but i think my interest in the genre my, my interest in, in sort of crime and mystery as such has always been there. Uh, you know, going back to like my childhood, I think I, I already enjoyed like mystery novels and that sort of thing. So that sort of curiosity about the investigative side of it has always been there. Um, but on reflection, I realized that um, what at least one and probably two incidents in me growing up had sort of played a deep role in in sort of my deeper interest in the side of things and one of that was um when i was in uh, grade eight i a, a, a classmate of mine sister was sadly murdered um, she was a, a young girl she was in primary school still at the time this was in boxburg i attended boxburg high and they were polish immigrants and um this young lady's sister eva was kidnapped and and murdered in Boxburg, and I think at the time, as my you know my very young thirteen year old brain, I understood what a horrific thing it was. It was shocking because, you know, when you're thirteen years old, you don't think about children your age dying, especially not in that manner. Um, we had just had the whole um, Kat Van Royen sort of thing play out in, in Boxburg and the surrounding areas. So I think that sort of all melded into one for me. But looking back, I realized now the deep impact that Eva and her case had on um, a recent, or not recently, a while back, I did a, a short episode on her case and included that in the podcast. And you know, I realize now how once I had left school, I, you know, at the time I didn't know anything about how the case went, whether they'd arrested anyone, because as a child, you don't really think about those things, you know. Um, but Eva's case was actually the first case I really started researching um, when I started looking at getting, you know, the podcast going and that sort of thing. And I, and I found resources to do so. Um, so she certainly played an integral part in me getting to the point of starting the platform and, and why I guess I do what I do. Your most watched podcast, as far as I can gather, is about Pop Poppy. Is it? Is that how you mm. And Yeah, can... Poppy Fanamaza, yeah. Can you tell yeah. what your story is and why do you think it was had such uh, interest from your viewers or from your mm. Sure. So um, Poppy Fanamava was a, a very young girl who was sadly terribly abused and neglected and um, essentially murdered by her mother's, um, well, they weren't married, so it was her mother's boyfriend. Um, and, you know, this, this case at the time, I know, rocked South Africa because of the multiple injuries that young Poppy had to her body. Um, when she was eventually pronounced dead in the hospital. And, you know, I'll try and space out the child cases that I do on the podcast because I know it's very impactful both for the listeners and for me. Um, it's, you know, those aren't easy cases to discuss. But I think, you know, although a lot of people express that they could not listen to the episode because of the the descriptions of the injuries to her and that sort of thing. And I fully understand that. 
I think a lot of people really wanted to understand the full story. Um, and that's something that I'm very grateful to be able to do through the podcast as well, because when these cases happen, and look, you know, Poppy's case was quite widely um, discussed at the time, you still only, as a member of the public, you get bits and pieces, and you sort of you paint this picture in your head of what you think happened. But over the years, you know, that becomes distorted, and I think that's that's almost a disservice to the victim. So what I really like about being able to podcast on these true crime cases is to put the facts in one place. So, you know, whenever someone thinks about Poppy's extremely tragic case, or perhaps they have a child living in the same streets of them, you know, as them who they think is being abused, they can listen to that story from beginning to end and understand how that crime happened and understand perhaps how they, as a member of the public, could step in in cases like that to avoid, you know, the tragic outcome that that Poppy had. Um, so, yeah, I think it, it's interesting to me that it's one of the most popular because so many people do find it difficult. But I think that was because it had haunted people for so long. That's not a single case out there. There's a lot of cases. I'm just busy reading um, Gustav von Staden's uh, Blood as a Voice, and she describes the experience to one of the children that she had to do an autopsy on. And it's yeah. just terrific. It's, uh, yeah, that what people do to other people is, is, is just absolutely horrific. No, absolutely. Um, yeah, I recently read Gustav's uh, book as well. I did her digital launch for the book. Um, and she, she's an incredible human being, and I'm grateful that we have. Um, people like her and you know that's that's one of the things that I've come to understand during this journey as well is coming into this I very much thought that we had this very um, faceless police system um, you know pathology system uh, you know justice system and as I've started to have the pleasure and honor of meeting people like Dr. Estelle von Sarden I've come to understand that it's a very difficult and broken, under-resourced system, but it's so filled with individuals like her who are so desperate to make a difference. Um, you know, and that image that she had in the book of her being pregnant and doing the autopsy on that child was just so striking. Um, yeah, so really grateful for people like her. Absolutely. There is people like Gerard out there and there's people like um, some very good prosecutors, etc. So there is some good people in our system, and I hope uh, some some remain still. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Tell me uh, about your book, uh, Samurai Sword Murder: The Mor Mornay Hansa Story. Can you tell me what you choose this book to do, and um, a little bit more about the book? Mm, sure. So, I mean, as I mentioned earlier, I've been a hobby writer since I was, you know, as long as I can remember. And probably from the age of six, I've always wanted to be published. Um, I thought it would be in fiction because I'd never in a million years imagined the last four years of my life happening. Um, but really it was through the podcast that the book came about because um, so last year, um, when Haramsa was released on parole, and um, last year in March. And at that time, my publisher, Melinda Ferguson, had wanted, well, she's now my publisher, then she wasn't. <laughs> she, she wanted someone to write a book about this case because she thought that there would be value in it. And she actually was doing some research and came across a podcast I'd done on Mornay's case and contacted me and asked if I'd like to write the book. Um, you know, and... <laughs> It's it's quite amazing that that side of it, but I'm also extremely grateful that it was that case that you contacted me about because I think, you know, so a brief description was um, when I had him, so was a young man who in 2008 um, took a samurai sword to his school in Krugersdorp and murdered one of his schoolmates and attempted to murder three other people. And there are so many elements of that case that, 
were missed at the time because the sensationalist parts of it were focused on. You know, there were allegations of involvement in, um, in the occult and, you know, all sorts of things that people focused on really the wrong things and things that I didn't feel served the victim or avoided future perpetrators like Warner. Um, so I was really grateful that that case was chosen um, because it helped me to be able to, to start dispelling some of these myths and move the focus firstly back onto Jacques, the victim, and secondly, start to explore some of the deeper sides of the psychology and not to excuse, you know, we never excuse perpetrators for the crimes they've committed. But I do think that it's important to understand what led them to that point as far as we can. Um, you know, because as I've said before in interviews, if one person reads that book, and looks at their son or daughter and says, maybe it's time we get you some help. You know, even if that child or teenager was not going to go on to become a mass murderer, you know, bad enough if they were going to harm themselves. Um, then if one person has been helped, then, then, you know, that's, for me, that's at least something. So, yeah, that was really what the main motivation behind it. Um, and I'm really glad that I was able to, to tell that story. And I know Jacques, the victim's family, was grateful that the truth was able to be told. And they got a lot of closure out of the book as well because they were involved in it as well. So I think it's, it sort of worked well for everyone. But Murnay's parents were also victims, if you think about it. Absolutely. And I focus on that in the book as well. Um, so that's one of the things that I think I learned from writing the book is that um, we hardly ever think about the perpetrator's family and the shame that they live with and the difficulties that they live with really for the rest of their lives. Um, you know, yes, they're able to go visit their children in prison and the victim's family cannot do that. But, um, you know, I, I often think and specifically in this case, a lot of shame and hatred was directed towards the Haramsa family that was very unnecessary. Um, so I talk a lot about that in the book as well. Okay, in terms of women empowerment and stuff like uh, that that we're speaking about today, um, mm -hmm. I can remember at uh, my primary school, our, um, our motto was, you know, we've gone, Skinner's is crock. And basically, if you translate it into English, this information is power. And uh, yeah, I'm also a librarian by faith. <laughs> Originally, I uh, also changed the uh, focus in my, in my life. Um, but yes, uh, why do you say that the information about the crimes and about the victims actually creates, uh, is empowering? Mm. So, I mean, you know, I think in general in South Africa, you know, if we break it down to our context, we do feel, with our levels of crime being so high, we feel very disempowered, um, specifically women, um, but I'm sure men as well, to an extent. Um, we feel, you know, like there's re not really much we can do to protect ourselves. Um, and I think that really by sort of understanding as far as we can the justice system, understanding how, you know, and this is, we have to be so careful not to, to victim blame because we don't ever want to put the, the onus for preventing a crime onto the victim. The onus for preventing a crime is always on the perpetrator because they shouldn't be committing the crime in the first place, you know, but I think if there is one way to empower ourselves, it's, um, certainly by learning, you know, understanding how we can, you know, psychologically move through the world in a different way, perhaps. Um, you know, even looking as women at the, the children we raise, how can we help to empower them to move through the world and interact with others in different ways, in, in perhaps better ways. And, you know, goodness forbid, we do become victims of crime, which sadly in South Africa, many of us will be in some context, understanding our rights and understanding how the system can work to help us. And sometimes we have to have that knowledge to make sure it does. 
Um, you know, so I think that for me has been um, a big part of why I do what I do as well. And I think, you know, a lot of my listeners will come, will say to me often every week that they, they do learn something from the podcast every week. Um, you know, so I try to cover really important topics um, like rape and consent and that sort of thing as well to ensure that I'm using the platform to educate people, to, to empower them in that way. So you spoke about rape just now, and that's one of the questions that I had for you. Uh, when you had a podcast and you mentioned rape, a lot of people actually contacted you. Why, was, why do you think this happened? I know that we are the rape capital of the world. Um, if you have a look at the amount of rape that takes place, and we've uh, touched on that a bit earlier. Why do you think your podcast touched uh, so many people? So I think, um, you know, the, the specific episode that I did, I I'd interviewed a rape counsellor and we discussed predominantly, you know, we discussed a few different aspects of um, different forms of sexual assault and rape. But one of our biggest conversations around that was consent and the different forms of consent and how consent is given and how consent is not given. Um, we discussed topics like uh, rape within relationships and within marriages. Um, you know, we, we really got down into how if consent is coerced, that is considered rape, whether there's violence involved or not. Um, and I think those are things that, especially, you know, like a lot of people contacted me and, and mentioned that they hadn't understood the entire spousal rape um, concept, um, you know, men and women. They were saying, you know, this isn't something that has happened within my marriage, but I'd never actually considered that a man could rape his wife. Um, you know, and if we think about it in South Africa, I think it's only about 20 years ago that spousal rape was actually criminalized. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's those deep conversations that I think often when we talk about rape, we do ourselves a disservice because we, we, we talk about it in this violent way where it's going to be some stranger who's going to grab you into an alley. And nine times out of ten, that is not what rape is. Um, it's someone you know. Um, it's maybe coerced consent. It's maybe consent taken away from you by you know, during substance use or something like that. Um, it really doesn't look the way we some we are very often talk about it and i think that's what that episode did for people um was really get them to start thinking differently about what rape and consent actually is um and then you know i had another episode as well on my so i've got another podcast which is sort of on hold at the moment but that is sort of survivors telling their own stories and I had a young man who told his story of childhood rape where his perpetrator was actually a female and she was a teenager. And I think those elements started bringing out, you know, not just that dynamic, but people started flooding my inbox with their own stories of childhood rape and understanding that actually what happened to me was rape. You know, and after that, I had actually had a few people who, who contacted me back again and said, I've actually now reported what happened. Um, some cases going back sort of 20 years, which was just incredible. Um, but I think it's so that's why that, that conversation was so important. Now, I've recently been uh, with another organization to support the video dancers in the Desert Foundation. There's a kind of awkward thing. Uh, there's now cases they're dealing with, and the perpetrator is a woman. Um, so it's not always men that the perpetrators, there's also women that perpetrators in the United States. It's a sick society, unfortunately, that we live in, 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 a, in a lot of ways. Yeah, absolutely. At the awards, what does it stand for? And you've got, uh, you won it last year and this year. Uh, what is it? Mm. The Africa Yeah. Um, it's the African uh, African Podcasters and Voice Actors Award. Um, so I, the, well, I slash the podcast, <laughs> True Crime South Africa, won uh, Best Crime Podcast in 2022 and 2023. Um, yeah, so that's essentially it. It was quite a, a nice one to win because it's a 
great organization that's sort of raising the profile for podcasters in Africa as a whole. Um, and I think, you know, podcasting is such a great way for us to be able to tell our own stories. Congratulations. And uh, you Thank talking you. about a, um, a television series? What's happening with that? You? Yeah, no, so, so that's actually not my television series. I've just, I've been lucky enough to be invited to appear on a few different um, documentaries and television series. So that's been happening a lot lately. <laughs> and that's a whole new world for me. But um, yeah, I'm, I'm really grateful to be participating in those. Okay, that's fantastic. Tell me if you've got a um, message for women out there um, during the 16 days of action, what would you say to them? Sure. I think, you know, it's it's such a broad, um, you know, there's, there's, there are so many forms of violence, um, psychological, physical, that, um, you know, that, that different, different ways that, you know, we can approach these 16 days. Really, I think what is vitally important is that we continue to support one another and that you know, if I look at um, a lot of the cases that I cover where there's domestic violence and femicide and GBV cases, very often that unfortunately goes back to young men who have been raised in environments where perhaps they have not been able to have a positive female role model. And, you know, again, that is not a blaming thing on, you know, it's always those perpetrators' choices. But I think that is something that we can do to take action to, you know, that they, they say that it, it all starts at home. And I certainly think it does. Um, it all starts with supporting our friends and our family members and, you know, really just standing up for um, what we what we know is right. Um, you know, often looking the other way is easier. But I think you know, standing up and, and just letting another woman know who might be suffering some form of abuse that she has an ear to to come to and you are there for her and she has other options. Sometimes that can make the difference between life and death, you know. So for me, it's, um, yes, certainly take, take physical action to protect yourself. Absolutely do believe in that. Um, I think that's psychologically empowering as well. Um, but also with that, don't forget to support one another. Fantastic message. Uh, where can they find your podcast? Thank you. So the, I do have a website, it's truecrimesouthafrica.com, uh, but the podcast is available on all podcast players. So it's on Spotify and Apple um, Podcasts. And really now it's um, you, you could pretty much just put it in Google and Google will find it for you. Absolutely. <laughs> And uh, in terms of your books, available to Amazon and through uh, exclusive, or how can they get all of the books? It should still be available in most bookstores. It is a year old now, so you know there may only be one or two copies, or they might have to get it in for you. But it is available on Amazon in ebook, and then I've also um, I narrated the audio book, which is on Audible as well. And what's your next book? Mm -hmm. I've actually got quite a few books in the in the the, the, the pipeline now. So um, yeah, working on another one. Can't unfortunately share what it's about yet, but um, that one will be out in May next year. And I've actually got two coming out next year. So um, yeah, again, looking at sort of the mass murder side of things, but also delving down, um, you know, into the world of sex work and how we can protect sex workers better in South Africa and that sort of thing. Fantastic. Nicole, thank you so much for talking to me. It was lovely speaking to you and uh, we will definitely meet each other. Absolutely. It was a huge pleasure. Thank you so much, Annette. Thank you very much.
Impossibly armed, I am your equal. I've empowered myself, I have practiced and trained. Fear won't control me. With my sisters in arms, we will make ourselves heard. We'll stand together. I'm a girl. Stand up.